Good morning, everyone. Hope you're enjoying our new Bible class format where you have good snacks, coffee, whatever you're having, and then a chance to gab and catch up. So this is delightful that you're here and uh, invite and bring more friends. So here we are. Our time is in God's hands. We're studying the book of Ecclesiastes. Each of these can stand on its own. We're basically taking a look at chapter 7. There's one more verse in chapter 8 we'll include. So that's where you are if you have your Bibles open or it's on your um, electronic device and you have a handout that's printed front and back. And we will begin with a word of prayer. Precious Savior God, what a privilege it is to open our, our Bibles, your holy word, to consider again the truths that you bring to us. We are amazed at how you've given to Solomon not only great wisdom, but this spiritual wisdom to impart and share to us that we can grow not only in our connection with you, but in how we relate to you in this world and to other people. Help us to better understand the wonderful truths he's presenting in this unique book and help us live a life of thanks to you for your greatest good, your mercy and grace. Amen. So we are chapter 7. If you're there, I'm there. And the study guide is handy. You get the introductory paragraph there. And we're going to look at these sections here. It's subtitle for this week. It's high time for mind time. Maybe you've heard. It's not really even a buzzword, but it's a very helpful word to think through what it means to be mindful, to be present in our circumstances, to understand where we're at and how we relate to our God and others. And this is really where Solomon is going in a rather unique way. So it's chapter 7. And if you don't mind, I'm going to jump into the first six verses and we'll have some consideration about that. By the way, with this lesson, we're at the second half of the book and having looked at life under God's created light under the sun, he's now taking a look at what it would be to have life under God, chapter 7. A good name is better than fine perfume. By the way, would you agree? There's some perfumes that really smell pretty good. I have to admit that, but uh, a good name is better than fine. I think I'm going to agree with Solomon, too. And the day of death better than the day of birth. Oh, boy, we'll talk about that. Is it better? It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, huh? Because a sad face is good for the heart. What? The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Solomon sounds as pessimistic as ever. What's the point? What's the point? What would you think, Nancy? We're out of our misery. <laughs> we're, we're out of our misery. And that really, as you think about the first six chapters of the book, isn't it true? Solomon is pointing out the meaninglessness of life without God. If you don't have a connection with God, really this life is what? You just live, you eat, you drink, you sleep, you wake up, and then you die. It's just, what is it, right? So... Um, that's really what he's capturing, a little bit of summary from the previous part of the book. That, uh, and also on top of not only we are out of our misery, but let's be realistic. This life is not to be the be-all, end-all of our existence, which is really what he's been driving home in the first chapters. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Verse 2 It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. What things come to mind for you when you visit a funeral home? Not that you probably schedule that for a, like a weekly thing, right? Hey, what are we doing this week? Well, let's go to a funeral home. <laughs> no, but you've been... Who has never been in a funeral home? I have to look at the Brody men. Have you been in a funeral home ever? Eden Brody? No? Okay. Uh, most of us have been in a funeral home. It's not spooky. Always pleasantly appointed. But if you go there, you're going usually because of what? Died. Somebody died. And you might have the visitation there where you're going to greet the family. But what goes through your mind? What, 
What comes to mind when you visit a funeral home? If they're Christians, they won the battle. What else goes through your mind? Abby? People will be crying. You want to be respectful. <laughs> You're not going to run crazy and jump off the furniture. And yeah. There's a little more somber tone. Why? Yeah. There might be a, a, a mood of sadness and somber uh, tone because you miss the person even though you know it's temporary. You'll see him in heaven. Anything else that goes through your mind? Steve? Thinking about when you're going to be there. Thinking about when you're going to be there. Because we live in this world and because we are sinners, the wages of sin is death. We will die. Be realistic. Uh, that goes through our mind. And then, of course, based on the passage I said, uh, we all, I don't know about you, but I walk in a funeral home. I'm there usually because I'm not just going to visit with the people, but I'm going to bring them a message of comfort from Scripture. But I am reminded, uh, as Steve said, too, that we're only on this earth for a short time. My day will come. But then why? That goes through my mind. The wages of sin is death. Uh, a funeral home puts us in mind of the fact that there is such a thing of death for only one reason, because there is such a thing as sin. Which tells me something else. If there is such a thing as sin and then death, I desperately need, I don't know about you, but I desperately need a Savior. That puts us in mind. And that's sometimes a good thing to be reminded of. By the way, this made me think a little bit um, from your perspective, how is death generally depicted in television, in the movies? I don't know if you watch television shows. Um, there are some that we do nowadays, but Ian? They'll be gone forever. You're looking at, yeah? Yeah. People feel terrible they didn't spend more time. How is death depicted, Sarah? Scary as something to be avoided? Okay. And when it comes to bad guys, what's that? <laughs> you, you're glad when they die, right? And they're dispatched really quickly, right? It's not a big deal, right? They got what they deserved, Nancy. When I go to funerals, I usually think about what the person went through just before they died. You think of what the person went through before they died? And everybody is in yeah. misery of some sort. And I'm, I'm yeah. so relieved now that they're out of their misery. Relieved that they're out of their misery. A lot of times it seems to me, though, it depends on if you're watching some kind of a hospital show or not, and they show people who are grieving. But sometimes it seems like death is treated a little bit more cavalierly than, you know, well, it happens, and they have all these detective shows, and another dead body, well, we got to go inspect that and find out who the bad guy was. And it's, there's, there's more to it than that. There's more to it than just, okay, that person, even if I'm sad that they're gone or the misery they went through, what's behind it really is sinfulness in the world and in our personal lives and then their desperate need for the Savior. And believe it or not, move on for another verse or so here. And verses 3 and 4, sorrow, uh, frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. When do we do that in the church here? During Lent, especially, especially Good Friday. Isn't that, isn't that something when you think about that? We actually act, not only acknowledge, but focus on the reality of not just the gruesomeness of why Jesus died, but he went there because of me and you. I mean, that, that's very sobering thought, very somber thought. 
And that really puts us in mind exactly what Solomon's saying, that frustration, better than laughter, better because a sad face. Once in a while, a sad face, if we're honest about our sinfulness, is good for the heart. And that why, that's why we, we don't finish um, the Lenten season and then just say, well, now let's uh, celebrate Christmas or something. No, we, we need to have, right after that, we need Easter, right? And I'm really thrilled that every year, and I know you have that too, but it's, it's really a unique blessing to have the ambiance we do for worship at Grace and the way it's planned. It is by intention that we have um, black pyramids on Good Friday. It is by intention that even though it's in April and the sun usually is not even set yet, but it's dimmer. In, it is by intention that we focus on the seven words and sayings from Jesus and reflect that our sins put him there. It is by intention that our emotions are drawn in and we are serious and sad about this. But it is also by intention that Easter morning is kaboom, whoa! <laughs> Cross procession, trumpets, uh, hallelujah, chorus, whoa, here we go. That is by intention because our emotions have the gamut. Solomon is touching on that kind of thing here. Verses 5 and 6, it's better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than listen to the song of fools. Um, Solomon's talking about being real, realistic about sin and living in a sinful world. Have you ever heard the song of fools? In contrast to the rebuke of a wise person, what is the song of fools? He's been talking about sin and the reality of sin in the world, the reality of sin and death. What is the song of fools in that context? Something to think about a little bit. The song of fools. Any thoughts on that? Sarah, some so thoughts on that? Pardon me? Yeah, living the present and when it comes to the subject of the reality of sin and death. Nah, he drinks, eh, no big deal. Okay, so we'll just get a little sick and die at the end. Hopefully it won't take too long and I'll just be gone, right? Just have fun. No big deal. The song of fools is, ah, let's just eat, drink, be merry. Let's have fun. Let's make this life as nice as possible. Let's do everything we can. And if we got some pain, well, there's got to be a pill for that. We got to, you know, just enjoy, have fun. That's the whole goal in life, right? The so that's the song of fools, not dealing with the reality. And I think it's interesting how Solomon describes it like the crackling of thorns under the pot. You can imagine they're cooking outside and you have a pot of boiling whatever stew, and right? And then underneath you got the kindling wood and there's thorns in there and you can hear the crackling as the fire is beginning to, to heat up. That's what the Song of Fools is like. Verses 7 and 8, extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. By the way, on that, do you feel the needle poke of this verse? Oh, pastor, you're accusing me of ex extortion? You're accusing me of bri giving bribes to people? No, I'm not. But the subject has to do in this verse with our view of extortion, bribes, has to do with our view of money. And none of us have ever had a problem in our understanding of and our view of our own money, right? Right? We've all handled that with grace and dignity that it's just a tool God has given us and we manage it wisely and we're not worried about how much we have or how much we're going to have for retirement or how to pay bills. None of us have ever had those worries ever, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> I get a needle poke when Solomon starts talking anything related to dollars and cents because I go, have I really been keeping God number one in my heart as I need to? And then, and then I think of the visit that we had here at church on Friday. So um, I'm not going to break Eighth Commandment, but there is, a, there, there is a family that had ties to Grace Church about 100 years ago. And they can trace their ancestry to people who are members here. And I would have to say that having studied through our archives and gone through that, that family had been quite a prominent family here at Grace Church. And they did have uh, 
material means. How's that? None of the descendants, once you get past two generations into the third generation, there was only one who was still a member at Grace, when I, and she was elderly when I started serving here. And there aren't really any. Now there is a different fifth and sixth generation person who recently joined, but most of the people of that family clan, which is a pretty large clan, are no longer not only Grace members, but not active in many Christian churches. A few are, I found out. They had representatives from the family. They were looking around. They wanted to see the building where their ancestor had worshipped. And one of them actually came and said to me, I know um, that I'm not a Lutheran, she said, but I'm very active. I love Jesus and I love the Bible. But the other people, she's whispering, the other people here, they're really not active in a church. And most of the family, most of the descendants of this big clan, it's just an interesting thing, what money can do. And that reminded me of the gospel we had, the gospel account previous Sunday. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Can there be people of means who end up in heaven? Yes. yes. Because Jesus said to the disciple, well, who can be saved? Jesus said, it's impossible for people, but with God, I can do that. And there are people who are blessed with means who are very selfless in their use of it and very focused on their Savior. But it was an interesting encounter that last Friday. Verses 8 and 9, the end of the matter is better than the, its beginning and patience is better than pride. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. What do you think he means by that? The end of the matter is better than its beginning. John. Good intentions start things off. But, uh, Good intentions start things off, but? but they, they fade away in the process. To understand the chunk that were these portions of uh, Solomon's book, Ecclesiastes, much of it, not all, much of it is in poetry, Hebrew poetry. So the second line of the verse does help us. And you put your finger on it there, John, with the end of the matter is the beginning, is better than its beginning. And patience, patience is better than pride. So on the study guide, I had this. You ever make plans, get started only to have the plan or project fizzle? Do you ever that happen to you? Great ideas, great plans, great something, and then it just, what happened to it? Kind of, oop. And how does God often go about his big plans? How does God often go about his big plans? If you think about that. God promised Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden. Listen to this conversation, Adam and Eve, that I'm going to have with Satan. Devil, I'm going to put hatred between you and the woman, between your descendants who hang out with you and hers. He, one descendant of the woman, is going to crush your power, devil, although you will strike his heel. And the very next verse of the Bible, it says, and God said, poof, let there be a savior, and there he was, right? Is that what happened? No. It took a long, long time for God's plan to save us. Why did God do that? He's God. He can do what he wants. But generally speaking, his plans take some time. Abraham, you and your wife are going to have a child, and from that child will come a great nation, and from that great nation will be the Savior. How long before Abraham and Sarah had that first baby? Well, she got pregnant that night, so nine months, let's see, right? How long did it take for that first baby? 25 years. It takes a while. Joseph was 17 years old, taken to Egypt. He moves up the ranks, and he's working for the army commander, but he gets falsely accused and dumped in jail. When he comes out, he thought that would happen quickly, not so quickly, Eventually, he's made prime minister because he could interpret Pharaoh's dreams. How old was he? 30. And eventually, there's plenty, and then a famine hits. And it takes seven years of plenty, and then the famine hits. It's going to take a year to a year and a half 
before it starts spreading around from Egypt to other parts of the Middle East. And then his family back in the Holy Land get hungry and they come to Egypt looking for food. And it takes a couple of trips and eventually his dad is brought to Egypt. By that time, you've got to figure after seven years of plenty and a couple of years of trips back and forth, J Joseph is probably almost 40. Jacob himself, his dad, wanted to be the first in the first in line with the promise and the blessing that uh, was intended for the older brother Esau. Well, with his conniving, God had him chased out and then he went to live with his uncle. How long did it take Jacob before he learned humility and God brought him back? 20 years. Moses was raised to learn leadership and administration for 40 years in the palace of Pharaoh. But he started to take things into his own hands, so off he went into the wilderness taking care of sheep before God called him into service. How many years was he learning patience and learning from God to submit his, his own pride? 40 years. The apostle Paul was converted, knocked off his horse, and suddenly, instead of a persecutor, he's now a preacher. How many years did it take before he went into his ministry mode? At least 14. There took some time. God's plans unfold more slowly than we would want sometimes. And that's literally what Solomon is talking about here. The end of the matter is better than its beginning because patience is better than pride. We get to the end of the thing, we can look back on it and say, well, that was really something. But to have the patience to have plans and let them carry out and play out. Somebody asked me, uh, you, I've told this story often, somebody asked me when we 14 and a half years ago cut the ribbon, remember that, Dave and Linda, you remember this, and some of you were here, on this building in March of 2007, we dedicated this building. So it's, I can't believe this March will be 15 years. But um, Somebody asked me that night, how long did it take to get the Grace Center built? I said, well, shovel in the ground until this day, that was about a year and a month. No, 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 no. From your first meeting with Mayor Norquist and the Department of City Development, how long did it take before we had this building? I had to do the math. 17 years <laughs> before, before we had this building. Sometimes these plans, our plans take a little while, and that's okay. Patience is better. And verse 10, don't say why were the old days better than these. Why isn't it wise to spend a lot of time talking about... I've never done this, by the way. <laughs> Talked about the good... Abby, stop it. <laughs> she knows me too well. I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> but why is it not wise to talk about the good old days? Why do you think? You can talk about the good old days, but why is it wise not to dwell on that? Sarah. First of all, you can't undo it. What else? Why is it wise, not wise to dwell on the good old days? Ian? Pardon me? Can't focus on the future. You're stuck. Why else is it not wise? To always talk about the good old days. Marilyn? Well, to always be joyful. So if you're only rejoicing in the past, you can't be rejoicing. Yeah. Right you dovetail with nicely with what Ian said, too. If you're always thinking about the past, you can't rejoice in what's now. And to be honest, you might be dwelling on stories about the good old days, and maybe they weren't all so good. <laughs> maybe they were good for you, but not for somebody else. So Solomon has some great wisdom for us. Verses 11 and following. Wisdom like, is like an inheritance. It's, it's a good thing, and it benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, and money as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves those who have it. I'm going to keep going. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can un discover anything about his future. Keep in mind when he's talking here about wisdom, it's not just head knowledge and brain power. But connected to his book, The Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes talks here in this section about wisdom is not just IQ, but also what's in your heart, in your connection with God, spiritual wisdom, and how that plays out practically in your life. 
True spiritual wisdom is having a close relationship with God and knowing how and why that happens and then letting that play out in gratefulness to the Savior. That's true spiritual wisdom. And in that context, how does acquiring wisdom preserve life? I have a passage for you to consider here from Ephesians 5. Can you see it on the screen, everybody? Will you join me in reading this one out loud? Here we go, ready? Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So how does acquiring wisdom preserve life? This business of a connection with God that's healthy and played out in thankful living, how does that preserve life? What is one way acquiring wisdom is a good thing? Well, what do you see in this Ephesians passage? Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. What does that mean? James. Well, wise would be considering the spiritual implications of everything that you do. So the opportunity to share God's word, to promote God's word. Considering the spiritual opportunities, everything you do, to speak God's word, to promote it, to proclaim it, to share it, making use of opportunities in life to live for him and whether it's directly speaking or whether it's our life of service and care. That was all about the worship theme today. Those of you who haven't been there yet and haven't heard it, but that's what worship and the sermon was all about. Jesus flipping the pyramid upside down. Greatness, you're on the bottom and serving, just like he went down below to give up his life and serve. Too often we are very into, I got to be on top, like James and John, the sons of Zebedee, wanted to be. By the way, in the gospel account, which Pastor Strong was preaching on, uh, Jesus calls to them, and that's what they're often called in the Bible, the sons of Zebedee, because their dad's name was Zebedee. But he gave them a nickname. Some of you know it. Abby, right? Sons the sons of thunder. James and John, the sons of thunder. I just, what? We want to sit one on your right and the other on your left in your glory. It's James and John. Can you bring some fire and brimstone on the people who aren't paying attention? Lord, you sent us out and they're not listening to us. The sons of thunder. I just always think, sons of thunder. These probably are the disciples who wore the black robes, you know, and they had an emblem on the back, sons of thunder, and they had a chain hook on their wallet up here, and they, they rode around on souped-up camels. Blah, 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 you know, they're sons of thunder. That's a picture with those guys, but. That's a little side note that came to my mind today. I was listening, but... Here's another passage. Mindful of wise use of our time. And then 2 Timothy 3. Let's read this together. From infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So we are talking high time for mind time. To be mindful of using our time wisely to serve others, especially with the good news of Jesus' love and also mindful of using our time wisely in the scriptures. That's how God helps us grow in godly wisdom. Look at verses 13 and 14. I think I did cover that already, didn't I? Yeah, I did that, read that. So um, in connection with those verses, here's what I was thinking of. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he's made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider. Look at uh, this passage from James. I put it on the screen also. Let's read this one together too. Ready? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Who signs up for that? Who signs up for that? When times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. Consider the fact that you have good times, you want to be happy, but we can even, the Apostle Paul in Romans says, we can even rejoice in our sufferings. That's hard for us to take, right? It's to boast and rejoice even in suffering. Who wants to do that? But that's a true, our famous phrase is theology of the cross, understanding that under Jesus' cross, we will live in a world and it will not always be pleasant. But we can rejoice because God uses that why to test 
and strengthen our faith and develop in us perseverance. Can you think of a hymn, by the way, that matches the thought here? Why should cross and trouble grieve me? There's lots of hymns like that. Yep. What God ordains is always good. His will is just and holy. As he directs my life for me, I follow meek and lowly. My God indeed, in every need, knows well how he will shield me. To him I gladly yield me. A lot of hymns are like that, and our new hymnal captures that also wonderfully. Solomon creates a vacuum when he says no one can discover anything about their future. Fill in the void. No one can discover anything about their future. He creates a gap. He creates an emptiness. Fill in the void. No one can anyth know anything about the future. <gasps> Doesn't that leave you empty? Well, fill in the gap. Marty. Trust in God. Yeah, trust in God because he's going to make us filthy rich. No, trust in <laughs> because you go to heaven. And it's really fascinating that um, when you think about for the, us as confessional Lutheran Christians, we know for sure where we've been and we know for sure where we're going. Isn't that amazing? That kind of certainty not a lot of people have. And that is sometimes when people ask me things like, well, what's the difference between Lutherans and other Christians? Or even somebody who has a Roman Catholic background. I'll use that word certainty as the difference. We actually know for absolute certainty where we're going to be. I don't just hope to be in heaven. I just want to be in heaven. I know I'm going to be in heaven when I die. Not because I'm Lutheran, not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm Caucasian, but because I have a substitute. And you have that same substitute. Certainty. We know for sure where we've been and we know for sure where we're going. Solomon with this book is designing it under God's direction to create that sense of emptiness and that longing. So we think, oh, where, where do we get the fill in the void? Ah, it's in Jesus. Verse 15. In this meaning of this life of mine, I've seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. That's not fair, somebody says to you. How do you respond? Talk about that at your tables. How do you respond to that? The righteous perishing in their righteousness, the wicked living long in their wickedness. That's not fair. You get to talk about that for a minute or so, and I'll ask you. Go ahead. Talk at your tables. How do you respond? We obviously have the answer at this table here, so we... So how do, you, how do you respond? The righteous perish, the wicked go on living. How do you respond to that? That's not fair, somebody says. You've never heard that, I bet. But. Joanne, how do you respond to that? The same way I responded when I was teaching and one of the kids, they took the same thing. It's not fair for me to give a test today. 
Not fair, kids say to their teacher. Yeah. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair is your response. Well, how do you respond to that? Anybody else want to add to that? Ian. I can't quite hear. Everything here is temporary. Even though it seems the wicked go on living and righteous die way too young and perish, everything is temporary. Eventually, we all have to face our maker, right? You've not heard that before? That's not fair. How about on your table? What were some thoughts you had about that? Ah. You need to have the valleys of life to appreciate. If you have good all the time, you may not appreciate it after a while, right? And that can be from a non Christian perspective, but from a Christian perspective. Non Christian and Christian as well. Solomon is very realistic. Have you ever been over righteous or over wise? Verse 16 Don't be over righteous, neither be over wise. Have you ever been either of those? What do you think he's talking about? Linda, you're smiling. Yeah, unfortunately, every day. When we get into ourselves, we get self-righteous. That's really what he's getting at there. Verse 17, don't be over wicked and don't be a fool. Why die before your time? It's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Solomon is talking about the famous phrase, the narrow Lutheran middle. On one hand, we can fall off the narrow path into the ditch on one side or the other and there's so many different examples of that too over confident and not confident enough just the balance the narrow lutheran middle verses 19 and 20 wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than 10 rulers in a city there's no one on earth who is righteous no one who does what is right and never sins this is an interesting little Phrase And how does verse 20, which I said, everyone sins, Solomon writes, there's no one who does right and never sins. How does that help rulers and parents balance and be mindful of the middle road? That's a little head scratcher, isn't it? Solomon makes the statement. There is not one who is righteous on earth, no one who does what is right and never sins. How does that keep rulers, parents on the middle road. Rulers dealing with citizens, parents in dealing with their children. What do you think, James? Well, just to an analogy, they've always said that the best alcoholic counselors are people who are alcoholics. The best alcoholic counselors are those who have been alcoholics. If you remember that you're a sinner, you're dealing with sinful children, if, sinful subjects. If you remember you're a sinner, whether you're a ruler or a parent, you're dealing with sinful people, which would then, keeping you on the middle road, prevent you from becoming too, too, what? Too righteous or strict on the one hand, but also, if you're forgetting about that, you might become too lenient on the other hand. Whether it's parents or rulers, this is an interesting statement by Solomon to keep us on the middle road. We're dealing with, as parents or rulers, are dealing with real people who are flawed, just like they are, right? And keeps us balanced. We'll go a little farther here. Verse 21, do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. So uh, give two reasons why it's good to let some things go in one ear and out the other. Why is it good to let things go in one ear and out the other? Brody. Probably sometimes that stuff is not the best to listen to because when you listen to it, it... 
hurts. Let it go in one ear and out the other. And don't want to let it create a wedge. And maybe, he said, keep in mind, as he goes on in verse 22, that you've probably done the same thing. <laughs> so Solomon is, again, very realistic. Verse 23 and following. All this I tested by wisdom. And I said, I'm determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever exists is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of fools. Solomon states that wisdom is beyond human beings. At the same time, we can investigate and search out wisdom. How can both be true? <laughs> How can both be true? Spiritual wisdom, being connected to God and living it out in our life, is beyond human understanding, and yet we can search it out. Well, how can both be true at the same time? <laughs> Solomon's making us think today. True. Right. <laughs> we continually dig and pursue and take to heart and ponder all the wonderful truths that God gives us in Scripture so we grow in our spiritual wisdom, our connection to Him and our life of faith. That's the whole point. But there are truths, Drew gave a couple examples like the Trinity or the real presence that go beyond our understanding. So both are true at the same time. We keep growing. There's never a time when you have plumbed all the depths of Scripture. There's always more to learn and to think about and to ponder so you grow in spiritual wisdom. On the other hand, there are some things that go beyond our understanding and Solomon says just that. Thank you, Drew. In verse 26, I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chained. The one who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Look, says the teacher, this is what I discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, not one upright woman among them all. And, of course, I'm wondering if you're thinking this is a put-down for women. But you have to keep in mind, all you uh, women here and men, pay attention, do you look in your Bible there at verse 28 and tell me what you see with the word upright as it's printed in your NIV Bible? Can you see something that's before and after the word upright? Is it there? What's that? Don't you have a little bracket underneath it? Oh, I'm thankful I'm using 1978 edition of the NIV. 2011, which I really appreciate, did not put brackets underneath it. The word upright in that verse, I found one upright man among it, not one upright woman. The word is actually not there in the original Hebrew. Yeah, you put brackets around it. So the NIV editors th th thought that in the context as they're translating, it would be a fitting word to put in. But actually, it's not there in the original. The sentence actually reads this. Uh, While I was searching and, but not finding, I found one man among a thousand, but not one woman among them all. Now you have to ask yourself then, well, what's, the con what's the point of comparison? What's he talking about? Is he saying, look it. I've been searching for spiritual wisdom out in the world. Who really has it? Who's got it? That's what he's talking about here in this section. He began this earlier in the chapter. Who really has an understanding and a grasp of what this really means to be close to God and to live it out perfectly in our life? And his answer is, I didn't find anybody. It's just a Hebrew way of saying, I didn't find one man, I didn't find one woman among a thousand. I just didn't, I didn't find anybody who really catches on what we need to know. So why do we pursue this? We want to keep growing closer to our God and live it out in our life because he's got a lot of people he sees in the world who have no clue. Would you agree that the majority of people in the world have no clue about what it means to be connected to God and live out their life? 
That's actually what Solomon is talking about. He's very realistic about this. And he wraps up. This is verse 29. This only I found. God made mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. Is that true, by the way? He designed people to be perfect. However, Genesis 3, sin came in the world and people go off their own way. Who is like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. So how do you deal with life's inconsistencies? How do you deal with the injustices that you see in your life and in this world? How can you even go on? We go through COVID. We go through political wrangling. We still see after effects of that. Supply chains are affected and being cut off, and you can't get the computer printer you wanted or the car, or you can't, you know, the price of lumber goes triple through the roof and coiling wires if you want to do repairs in your house, all that stuff. And, oh, sorry, we will be able to start your house repair project under Windows, but those aren't available for another nine months. You just The supply chain is interrupted. They can't get plastics for their machinery and tools, and, well, this is just stupid. I just might as well die and go to heaven. Take me home, Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Linda. Everyday reminders that we live in a sinful world. Everyday reminders. And this is what Solomon is doing. Thank you, Linda. Everyday reminders. We live in a sinful world. There has to be something better, and there is in Jesus. But because we know that, for sure we can cope. All right, so I don't get the house project done on time. Oh, right, so it costs a little more. Oh, the price of gas goes up. Well, that's what happens. The market goes up, the market goes down. That's the way it is. But we still have Jesus, and we still have him to share, and more fun. And that means we can sing about it at the end of this lesson. Going to join me? Oh, how about I put it up on the screen, too, if you'd like to look there. You can on the page or on the screen. Let us suffer here with Jesus to his image air conform. Heaven's glory soon will please us. Sunshine follows on the storm. Though we sow in tears of sorrow, we shall reap in heavenly joy. And the fears that now annoy shall be laughter on the morrow christ i suffer here with thee there oh share thy joy with me thank you for your time one trivial pursuit question if you have good eyes on the screen in the hymnal we have now that's hymn 704 what was the hymn number of let us ever walk with jesus in cw 93 in the previous hymnal 429. But what was it in TLH? I know it because it was my confirmation hymn. 409. See, we have to learn new numbers now. I don't know the new, new book, right? But a mighty fortress is our God. In the previous hymn that we just finished using is always hymn number 200 and 201. In TLH it was? 262. <laughs> oh, that's just fun. We got to love about that stuff. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Because it